Just as a quick disclaimer before we start, this video is sponsored by Skillshare, and I'll be talking about that a little bit later on. Now, 2020 has definitely been an interesting year for a number of reasons, most of them being pretty terrible, but it's definitely been crazy in terms of camera equipment. You know, we've had the Canon R5, the Sony a7S III, Blackmagic Design just released their 12K camera, which completely came out of nowhere, and it's led to a significant increase in the number of people asking me, what camera should I buy? There's a lot that goes into that, and it would be impossible for me to give good recommendations to every single person that asks me this. So I thought instead I would make this video where I run you through my list of priorities for camera equipment, you know, the sorts of stuff that I look out for when I'm looking at purchasing a camera, and then you can use that information to make a more educated decision on what camera is right for you. And I'm gonna warn you, it's gonna get very geeky, it's gonna get very nerdy, and it's gonna get very technical and I love it. However, we're gonna have to start things off with the most boring thing and the least technical and the least nerdy thing, which is budget. I mean, budget obviously is a huge factor in the equation. An Aria Alexa Mini LF is the perfect camera for me on paper. You know, it checks every single box, except it's 70,000 pounds. So now it's not the perfect camera for me. Now, although it's the most important thing, it's also the most dull and boring thing. So we're gonna be moving on from that. And instead we're going to be talking about codec. Codec for me, is a bit of a deal breaker because I've been very spoiled for the past three or four years. I've been shooting in raw video and it's gotten to the point now where I can't actually see myself ever buying a cinema camera or any camera for that matter that doesn't shoot raw video at least not as my main camera. With that being said, raw video only really applies to a small set of camera, and they tend to be in the more cinema camera category. It hasn't really made it over to consumer cameras just yet, at least not without external recorders and things. So if you can't get raw video, I would suggest looking out for ProRes 10-bit. That's a pretty robust and incredibly popular codec. Next up, we have dynamic range. Dynamic range is pretty much up there in terms of importance. It's almost, it's kind of edging it with the codec because well, it's kind of what sets cinema cameras apart from consumer cameras. You see, dynamic range is essentially the amount of contrast that your camera can capture in a scene, and it's measured in stops of light. So for example, my Ursa Mini Pro G2 can capture 15 stops of dynamic range. This is a pocket cinema camera. I think this has 13 stops of dynamic range, and then something like the EOS R, I believe, has nine. Now, the beauty of dynamic range and having lots of dynamic range at your disposal is that it gives you plenty of creative freedom. It means you're not really limited by the sort of shot that you want to do. For example, if you want to take your subject and you want to put them in front of a bright window, you don't have to choose between having detail in the window and having the subject in silhouette or having the, the subject in detail and having the window just completely blown out and overexposed. You don't have to make that decision because with high dynamic range, you can have detail outside of the window, but also have detail on your subject. Now, obviously you can creatively choose to overexpose things or underexpose things and have silhouettes. It's totally fine but with high dynamic range, you have the option. Next up, we have color science. Color science is definitely hotly debated. It starts a lot of fights on the internet. People arguing about which camera system has the best color science, which ones reproduce skin tones the best. And that's because it's very subjective. The best way to compare color science between cameras is obviously to use those cameras, shoot with them a bunch, put all of that footage into your editing program, and then just look at the clips and ask yourself which ones have the nicest colors, which ones look the most natural, which ones which ones do I like the most? And if you can't do that, then I'd suggest just watching a bunch of YouTube videos, just raw clips from the cameras and just look and ask yourself, does it look good? Does the footage actually look good? Do the colors look nice? Next, we have the usability of the camera. The features of the camera that don't directly apply to the image, but they make it easier to live with. So for example, built-in ND filters, does it have industry standard connectors? You know, do you have SDI ports? Do you have XLR ports? What batteries does it take? What is the battery life like? Does it have buttons for specific functions that I use quite frequently? Or is it purely touchscreen operated? I mean, I've got a list of things here. You know, you've got the size and weight, the boot up times. Boot up time is incredibly important. It doesn't sound like it would be important, but certain cinema cameras take 20, 30 seconds to start up. And if you're shooting documentary content, which we often do, that's a massive pain in the backside. You know, something cool is happening and you're like, I wanna film it. And then you press the start button and you just sit 
Now it's time for a quick message from today's sponsor, Skillshare. Just the fact that you're watching this video suggests to me that you're interested in learning new things and Skillshare is the perfect platform for that. It's an online learning community that I personally have been using a bunch recently and I'm going to share with you some of my favourite things that I've recently picked up. Firstly, I took a class with Aaron Draplin of the Draplin Design Company all about logo design, the secrets of shape, type and colour. I'm such a nerd for that sort of thing and it inspired me so much that I spent the next few days in Adobe Illustrator designing all sorts of logos for various imaginary companies and I went on to buy his book. Look, that's how inspired I was. Next, I took a character animation class with B. Grandinetti, all about how to animate characters using Adobe After Effects, because I've always been curious about adding animation into some of my filming projects. And finally, I took a class on DIY cinematography by Ryan Booth. He covered the process of how to shoot a mini documentary with a fairly small crew, which applies directly to the sorts of things that we do. And I picked up a bunch of details that I'd never really thought of before. I think it's safe to say that I genuinely do love Skillshare. I mean, what else can I say? There's no ads so you can focus on the classes the whole system is curated specifically for learning i mean it's just a fantastic community that i would be promoting even if they weren't sponsoring me which i probably shouldn't say because then they might stop sponsoring me look just head down to the description the first 1000 of my subscribers to click the link will get a two month free trial of premium membership so you can explore your creativity all right that's enough of that, I could talk about it all day. Let's crack back on with the video. Next up, we've got Sensor Size. And Sensor Size has really jumped up a number of places recently because there's so many more options in terms of Sensor Size. You know, it used to be that cinema cameras would just have Super 35 sensors, or maybe a few of them would be Super 16 or Micro Four Thirds, but Super 35 was the industry standard. Whereas now you've got full frame cinema cameras and you even have large format cinema cameras. And I've got to be honest, I've never shot on a large format or a full frame cinema camera, but I'd definitely be curious to do it because it seems like it would be interesting. Another one that is low priority, but also nice to have is high frame rate options. I mean, I generally expect my cameras to at least be able to film in 60 frames a second. Having 120 frames a second like I have with the Ursa G2 is very, very nice, but I'm just not someone that really shoots in slow motion, but I know people do, and I know lots of people, and for a lot of people, this is gonna be way higher up the list than it is on mine. And now we come on to the lowest priority on my list. The last thing that I look out for with a new camera, and it's gonna come as a surprise to a lot of people, is resolution, you know, the resolution that it shoots in. And that's gonna sound crazy, but I think we've reached a point now where resolution is good enough that it kind of doesn't matter. Like every camera that is releasing is at least HD, you know, a minimum of HD, but normally 4K. And that's, that's plenty good enough for the sorts of stuff that I shoot. And the proof is in the pudding. I've just bought this pocket cinema camera. It's the original one, shoots in HD, but it's good HD. That's the key here, is that if you have a strong codec, this shoots in RAW. If you have the dynamic range, this has got 13 stops. And if you have the nice color science, images look lovely out of this thing, then HD is good enough. It's great. And I don't get me wrong, I like having 4K because I like being able to slightly reframe things. I like being able to punch in, do some digital zooms. I like being able to stabilize stuff, but that's all I really use 4K for. And to really drive this point home, I'm gonna ask myself the question, would I rather shoot on a camera that is 32K? Let's go completely out there, but it has a horrible codec, it has terrible dynamic range, and it's got horrible color science, or shoot in HD with a lovely raw codec you know, really nice color science, nice natural, natural skin tones. And what's the other one? High dynamic range. You know, would I, out of those two, I'd definitely rather shoot in HD. I don't care about 32K, I, I want HD. And that's it. So those are my list of priorities in terms of buying a camera. I hope this has been somewhat educational. Uh, I hope that you found it interesting. And I hope that this helps you buy the perfect camera for you. So you can stop asking me, what camera should I buy now? And if you do ask me that, I'm going to direct you to this video. All right. Okay, I really do hope that you enjoyed this one. It's been fun to record, and I'll catch you in the next one. See ya.